Well, I'm very pleased to welcome back our internet audience to our latest installment uh, in the in Unsilencing the Archives uh, Zoom lecture series. Um, I'm Aaron Brody from the Bade Museum at Pacific School of Religion. Uh, and before I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, um, I'd like to introduce our uh, associate curator, uh, Brooke Norton, who will read uh, our introductory statement. Brooke. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Berkeley, California is on the territory of the Huchian, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone. We respect the land and the people who have stewarded it throughout many generations, and we honor their elders, both past and present. We are living in a moment that warrants deep reflection on our past, wherein even our most venerated figures deserve reasonable scrutiny. During his time directing the archeological excavations at Tel Nazba, W.F. Bade participated in harmful stereotyping of Palestinian Arabs that was common among white Americans and Europeans conducting fieldwork in British Mandate Palestine. Some of these attitudes appear in print in his popular 1934 book, A Manual of Excavation in the Near East. Museums are also scrutinizing their collections, including evaluating the legal status and the ethics with, with which they were acquired. As stewards of the legacy of the Bade Museum and its holdings, it is our responsibility to faithfully evaluate the process by which the collections were acquired within the context of our contemporary moment. One approach is to ask new questions of the archival materials in order to examine critically the manner and impact of archeological work on indigenous communities and to investigate the colonial conditions in which it played a part. The Body Museum recognizes that its location and collection are part of ongoing and painful colonial legacies that contributed to historical inequalities. These legacies have directly and indirectly impacted populations locally and abroad in Palestine where the excavations were conducted under the authority of the British Mandate Government of Palestine. In an effort to bring to light these issues, to serve a, a broader public audience online and to connect to the local communities that it serves, the museum is taking action to become a more inclusive, welcoming and equitable institution that practices the philosophy of radical inclusion adopted by its parent institution Pacific School of Religion. One of these steps is the creation of an open access web exhibition and public programming like this lecture series, which highlight decolonizing themes. We invite you to participate in these programs so that together we can listen, learn, and work towards creating a more inclusive museum community. The Body Museum and the Palestine Exploration Fund would like to thank you for joining us today. Wonderful, thank you so much, Brooke. Well, it is my distinct pleasure uh, to uh, introduce Dr. Rachel Sparks today. Uh, Dr. Sparks is Associate Professor and Keeper of the Collections at the University College of London uh, Institute for Archaeology. Her PhD is from Sydney University. She has a very rich uh, background in fieldwork. Uh, she's worked on numerous excavations in Jordan, uh, including Pella, the Petra Church Project, uh, Tel Eilat Gasul, uh, in the Garandal Archaeological Project. She's also worked at Aksum in Ethiopia. She also served as field excavator for the Scottish Urban Archaeology Trust and the Institute of Field Archaeology Unit uh, in the United Kingdom and on a series of sites uh, in Sydney, Australia. Her museum experiences include curating the Petrie Palestine Collection at the UCL Institute of Archaeology researching South Sudanese ethnographic collections at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, one of my favorites, uh, and her current role uh, in, as keeper of collections for UCL's Institute of Archaeology. Dr. Sparks's research interests include the history of archaeology in British Mandate Palestine, with a focus on the work of Flinders Petrie and Kathleen Kenyon, an interest that de developed out of her work with the Institute of Archaeology's Near Eastern Collections and Archives. Uh, interests also uh, include the archaeology of the Bronze and Iron Age Levant, especially cultural interaction between Egypt and the Levant, ethnicity, identity, and material cultural transformations, uh, and writing as material culture. And she has published widely in each of these categories. Uh, so today, uh, she will be lecturing on the development of archaeological communities of practice in British Mandate uh, Palestine. So it is my pleasure 
to yield the floor to Dr. Sparks. Well, thank you very much. Um, right, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, are we good now? We are good. Excellent. <clears throat> so first of all, I'd like to thank all the organisers of this series for inviting me to take part. Um, it's actually been a very interesting ride so far with all the wonderful papers we've had, and it's really nice to be able to contribute to that. When we're looking at something like the history of archaeology, it's often presented in the literature as a history of the careers of great people. So sort of prominent, white, usually male, European or American archaeologists like Flinders Petrie, Leonard Woolley and so on. And so people talk about their digs and their discoveries, rather like you find Egyptian pharaohs talking in their inscriptions about single-handedly winning battles and the like. This is actually part of a wider process that Nick Shepard has called the habits of elision in the archaeological record. And this is where those that do the work on a dig gradually get edited out of its narrative, with all the credit getting shoved on to the director or the figurehead. And of course, in the colonial context of British mandate excavations, this becomes even more marked when you start looking at the role of the Indigenous workforce on these projects. So this is something that I'm trying to address with my paper today and to be able to return credit and some agency to the many Arab men, women and children who worked on foreign excavation projects in Palestine during the 1920s and the 1930s. And I'm going to do this by exploring the idea of their archaeological communities of practice and show how these generated knowledge and also opportunities for their Indigenous participants. So... These are my basic research objectives of um, this work. I'm trying to characterise what these communities of practice in the Mandate era excavations are and a map of the professional networks that developed on them. And through, as part of that, I'm going to be identifying the roles that individuals are playing in creating the networks and in producing and disseminating archaeological knowledge. And I've got various sources of information that I've been drawing on for this, very similar to some of my um, colleagues in this series. The most important institutional ones for me have been the reports of the Department of Antiquities of Palestine. And these are really important for understanding things like dig, dig logistics, tracing the movement of some of the people involved in the project, particularly the Egyptian staff, um, but also learning incidentally about things like labor disputes on digs and so on. So they give us a really good context for an excavation and its community. But you can add to that the individual excavation archives, which are incredibly rich at times. And these, of course, are placed all around the world in various sponsoring institutions. I've put on the screen some of those which you can find in London, just as an example. When we come to the site publications, these are the ones that suffer most from that process of elision that I talked about. Um, so often it's only the more senior Arab staff that tend to get mentioned, if mentioned at all. And you can add to that autobiographical accounts, um, usually of the Western participants in the dig, which give a bit more of a personal perspective. Okay, the quality and completeness of all these archives is quite variable, um, but one thing they have in common is they tend to present everything from a Western perspective and through filters of kind of casual colonial racism. So that's something you need to take into account. Anyway, to investigate these different networks, I basically created a timeline of excavations in Mandate Palestine, had a look um, at those excavations that had accessible archives and then followed that up by looking at individual projects in more detail. And because of my background, I started with three digs of Flinders Petrie in Southern Palestine, Gemma, Farah and Tel Ajul. And that's basically because I've already got a good knowledge of this material through my role as keeper of the collections at the Institute of Archaeology, because we have a lot of his finds and archives. But then I expanded it to look at a range of British and American projects at sites like Samaria, Jericho, Tel Kaisan, Lakish, Tel Nazba, Tel Bait Mosin, and Bethel. At this point, I want to introduce one of the key concepts of my research, which is the idea of the community of practice. And this is something that comes from the work of Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger, which was published back in 1991, the idea of situated learning. And the idea behind this is that learning is actually a social process that actually gets embedded in everyday life. So it's something you acquire through taking part in shared activities. 
And it's been around for a while, this idea, and it's been applied to quite a few archaeological settings now. To just give you two examples, the work of Danielle Candelora, she looked at um, ancient Egyptian military communities from this perspective, and then Laurent Dissard, who applied it to modern salvage excavations in Turkey, which obviously has closer relevance to what I'm doing today. So what are these communities of practice? Well, I think it's a useful concept to start to apply to fieldwork in Mandate Palestine. And if you look at it in that setting, the community is obviously going to be the dig. And the digs have a certain number of features that they share. They create communities that have this shared purpose and they're quite intensive. So you get a lot of interaction between its members over a short period of time, typically a few months. People enter that community with quite different levels of experience and expertise. But when they're there, they engage in what we can call situated learning. And so they're acquiring knowledge through participation in these shared activities. And often this is quite informal. So knowledge is created and transferred between participants um, as they're interacting, but it's not necessarily sitting down and being told this is what you have to do. Then for the duration of the project, what you find is that you get a sort of gestalt where members become part of a single dig culture. And so they learn, first of all, what's expected of them in their various roles on the project, but also the appropriate dig culture and the dig ways of doing various things. So who belongs to this community? Well, with Dessard's research, he actually excluded local labour from his community of practice because he felt they weren't directly involved in research. But I actually think this is quite a narrow interpretation of what research is. And for me, if I look at my communities, I see the local diggers are contributing to the research design in many ways, for example, providing local knowledge of their own landscape. So often you read in accounts of the digs that people who are working for them are drawing their attention to suitable places to work. They're telling about where things have been found in the past in their communities and so on. The diggers are, of course, also producing the evidence that is going to actually be used to interpret the site. And the value of this data depends very much on their skill in distinguishing between things like different types of deposits, but also accurately recording the fine spots of their objects. So in this view, my community of practice is quite wide. It got, has got everybody in it from the manual labourers, the skilled excavators, the field supervisors, field recorders, architects, surveyors, pot washers, photographers, conservators and dig directors. Um, they're all creating this shared experience. OK, I'm just going to run a very short bit of film from um, Teller Le Jewel while I make my next point, just to see some of this community in operation. In a recent paper, Alison McKellen and Nyla Bird made some interesting observations where they pointed out that early archaeologists had rather double standards regarding their attitudes to their field labour. So basically, they underplay their intellectual contribution to the dig, but at the same time, they're completely reliant on the data these contributors are producing. Um, they also pointed out there was similar hypocrisy in the way, for example, scientists treat their laboratory assistants. It's a very parallel sort of situation. And I think it's important to realise here that in the mandate period, the diggers who are at the coalface of excavation, they're not just passive tools in the hands of some random Western experts. They are active agents in that process of knowledge acquisition, and they should be credited with that. So let's look at what the dig is. Well, a dig is made up of, you know, you all know this stuff, three basic core activities. You've got excavation, field recording and research. But the colonial framework in which these projects are operating in the Middle East meant that the Western staff members on the projects tended to have the greatest flexibility within the system in terms of how they might move between these different activities. And we can think of it like a dig hierarchy. Now I've done a little sort of pyramid here to show that. Um, because mandate digs were very hierarchical in structure. And of course, they're being framed by boundaries of class and nationality. And this is something you might remember that Mahmoud Hawari was talking about when he gave his seminar in this series back in February. So here's the hierarchy on my, my hypothetical dig. Um, your position in the pyramid is reflecting things like your status, your wage level, and so on. So right at the top, of course, you've got the dig sponsors. But because they're operating at a distance and they tend to go through the dig director for most things, they weren't really a part of this active dig community of practice. But I think everybody below that in the pyramid, we can consider to be an active participant. 
What we don't see in these tiers, of course, is what a person's skills are or the type of activities they're actually engaging in. And I think that's an important point because many of the different tier represented here are actually doing the same things. So you've got your locally sourced diggers, your diggers recruited from other districts, your foremen, your Western field staff, they're all involved in actually excavating, but they're not being accorded equal status within the system. And the same if you look sort of midway up, around about here where we've got our Arab surveyors, draftsmen and secretaries, they're doing the same jobs that Westerners are holding on other projects in a lot of the American digs, the Arabs are given these roles. Um, this is, for example, where you find people like Labib Soryal, the Egyptian surveyor we met in Jeffrey Thorne's lecture back in last December. Yet with the underlying racism we've got at this time, they're not considered part of the same social sphere as the Western colleagues they're working beside. So it's all very uneven. Okay, so that's your basic structure. What I want to do now is move on to look at the roles played specifically by the Egyptian and Palestinian field staff in our dig communities. Okay, so the most well-known of, of these groups are probably going to be the Egyptian workforce. And these are often known collectively as Guftis, which is shorthand basically for anyone from the villages in and around Guft in Upper Egypt. Flinders Petrie, the, the Egyptologist, first began working with these men at Coptos in Egypt in 1893. And he found them so useful to him that he actually started hiring them for other projects he had elsewhere in the country, where they were brought into work alongside locally sourced labor. And part of their role on his digs was to actually train up less experienced workers. And over the next three decades, he actually ended up employing about, well, over a hundred different Gufti workers on his digs. You can read a lot more about these men in their wider contemporary context in the works of Stephen Quirk, his book Hidden Hands here, and Wendy Doyen. What's interesting is that the Gufti workforce really managed to carve out and maintain an effective monopoly on the supply of skilled archaeological technicians throughout Egypt. And they were a very tight-knit community and they stayed that way, with many of their sons and grandsons following them into archaeology, and of course their descendants continue to be employed as archaeologists across Egypt today. Well, the practice of employing Gufti workers was soon adopted by other Egyptologists, including George Reisner, who we see here. And Reisner is particularly interesting in his role and relationship with these men because he gave them much greater autonomy and responsibility on his projects than Petrie and some others. Here we see Reisner in the Giza dig house, along with Muhammad Said Ahmed Diraz, who was his head Reis or foreman in the late 1930s. And we see Muhammad and his brother on the other side um, playing chess on the dig. Muhammad's father was a guy called Said Ahmed Said Diraz, and he had actually been head rice, rice for Reisner before him. And he's particularly well known in the industry for keeping really detailed fieldwork diaries in Arabic with lovely measured illustrations and everything with them. And Reisner was very unusual for his period in that he involved his Egyptian staff so directly in the record keeping for his projects. And he was maintaining records in both English and Arabic, um, which most of his colleagues did not do. Okay, so that's the background from Egypt. Let's look now at their um, role on mandate era excavations in Palestine. And again, we have to go back to Reisner here because he was probably the first one who actually introduced these Gufti archeologists to Palestinian digs. And he takes several Egyptians out to him when he works at Samaria in 1909, and they're acting as foremen and also household staff on the dig. Later, under the mandate, um, the practice of hiring Egyptian workers becomes very widespread. And here again, Reisner seems to have still been involved in facilitating this, although he didn't actually go back to work in Palestine himself. And we see many of the archaeologists who do go to work in Palestine, for example, Clarence Fisher or John Crowfoot, had actually worked closely with Reiser in Egypt. And they were able to therefore take advantage of the contacts that he had with the Gufti community there. Now, here in, in this slide, we see Fisher on the right, seated in the centre, um, along with his Egyptian workers at Megiddo. Um, in the other side, we see four, well, there's actually five, but one man is, is unidentified, of his Egyptian workers, which he took to work with him at Tel Gemma in 1926 in Palestine. So what were these guys doing? Well, one of the most common roles they got given was the role of rias. I've mentioned this term already, or foreman. And you often see them in contemporary photographs sort of 
carrying out that role and you can often identify them because they dress differently to the local workers and quite often they carry this kind of rod of authority as well. You see this guy on the edge of the photograph doing just that. And on those digs, they're managing the workers on site, um, but they're also being called in as excavators themselves when they've got a problematic deposit or something that needs a delicate hand, like cleaning skeletons, excavating burials, and so on. And we also hear of, of some of these goofies being involved in things like block lifting mosaics on sites. They're senior, they're better paid than their fellow workers, but the rates are quite variable. And you can see this in the document I've got on the right. And basically, the rates don't seem to be based on age. They seem to be more related to experience and perhaps their perceived value. This list is really interesting. It's part of a longer document that was prepared by Clarence Fisher for the 19 fieldwork season at a site called Antioch on Orontes. If you know your geography, you'll know that's in Syria, not Palestine. But it's a very useful archive because Fisher was director for a number of seasons and he worked very for long periods of time in, in Palestine. And it gives us good insights into his views on the workforces he employed, um, particularly these Egyptians. Anyway, from this document, we get a good insight into the Kufti network of, of the region at the time, which extended all the way from Egypt through Palestine into Syria. And we learn, for example, that Reisner got his information um, for who he might employ on the dig at Antioch from two of his head Reisers. The full list we've got names 23 men who are all from Kuft. And many of these men, as we can see from their CVs, have prior experience for working on American and British digs in Palestine. When we combine this information with other records, we can see that many of these men had actually worked together on these digs. Um, they're, they're contemporary um, for seasons, and several had also worked for Fisher. So while these men are going to be parts of individual community practice on numerous digs, there are also a lot of interaction and crossovers between those communities. So now I'm going to look at the career of one particular man in a little bit more detail as an example of, of how um, their careers sometimes panned out. And this is a guy called Sultan Bakit. Um, he doesn't actually appear on Fisher's list of employees potentially to be used at Antioch, probably because he's already engaged elsewhere. He wouldn't have been available. Um, he came actually from a village called Balas, which is near Guft, but not, not, not Guft itself in Upper Egypt, but he's part of that Gufti community. And he worked for Petrie at various sites in Egypt between 1919 and 1924. He was one of seven Egyptians that Petrie decided to take out to work with him in Palestine at Tel Gemma in 1926. And he goes on to work with him for three more seasons at Farah and two seasons at Tel Ajul. And I should point out here that Leslie Starkey was field director on all of these projects. And in fact, for two of the Farah seasons, he was the only director because Petrie was actually wintering in Rome. So there is a relationship not only with Petrie and Sultan, but also with Starkey that needs to be taken into account. He's actually shared the family name with a guy called Umbarak Bakit, who was another Egyptian Petrie hired to work in Palestine, but had also a long career back in Egypt where he worked with other family members. So, you know, there's family relationships in this community that have been carried on to the projects they work on. And what we ha find happening is um, when Starkey actually breaks away from Petrie in 1933 and goes to start his own dig at Bakit, he actually steals Sultan and takes him with him as one of his main foremen. Then after the Jewel and the Quiche field seasons ended, Sultan moves across to other digs in Palestine. So he goes to work for Rice, um, for John Crowfoot at Samaria, and for William Bardet Tell in Nazba. And I think um, from the record, Starkey seems to be acting as an intermediary in arranging this setup. And then when he's not on other digs, Sultan is also acting as a head guard at the Quiche. And he actually continues in that role after the dig finished all the way up to 1942. So, you know, he had a very successful career and he actually invested quite a lot in the Palestinian part of his career as well, to the extent that he eventually wound up living there for a number of years. As for other Egyptian staff, um, Petrie tended to be fairly restricted in how he used his Egyptians. So he tended to focus on using their excavation skills and also using them to train up his local workforce in that community of practice, of course. But in contrast, if you look at their roles on American projects, we see people like Fisher, Bade, Albright actually giving their Egyptian staff a lot more diverse roles on their digs. And so some rices are also working as pottery conservators, assisting site photographers, liaising with local landowners and so on. So why did this group of 
Egyptian field specialists come to be so important in Palestinian digs? It wasn't like there weren't other people available. Well, I think it's no coincidence that many of the foreign archaeologists we find directing projects in the region having a prior history themselves of working in Egypt. And when from their background, I think they came to rely quite heavily on Egyptian expertise. And so they were probably quite biased in favour of it. And this did lead to a view that kind of spread that Egyptian workers were superior to the Palestinian Bedouin or Fellaheen in the roles that they were given on excavations. To give you an example, um, we've got a letter here on the right written by archaeologist John Crowfoot, who was British. Um, he was head of the British school in Jerusalem and about to excavate at Samaria when he wrote it. And he looks pretty colonial as he's seen in this picture with his pith helmet and everything. Anyway, he puts forward a fairly standard visa request to the Department of Antiquities on behalf of his Egyptian workers he wants to bring across the border. And he justifies bringing them on his dig by saying, I cannot find men of the same calibre in this country. So basically, I've got to bring them over because nobody else here is competent. Um, it's quite interesting if we look back a bit in time at Reisner when he published the results in the same site, Samaria, which he dug first in the 1920s, and I should say Crowfoot knew Reisner very well. Um, Reisner praises the trained skill, the industry and the loyalty of his Egyptian workers and characterises the local village workforce as undisciplined, inexperienced and indolent. And you can't kind of help think that maybe some of this attitude is being rubbed off um, onto Crowfoot. Of course, neither men are allowing for the fact that the local labour force, when they're brought in to work on a site for the first time, are usually just agricultural labourers who are not going to be at all familiar with what excavation requires. So it's not going to be that surprising if initially they don't have any skills in this type of work. And yet, um, Riser himself does go on to acknowledge that after a season or two in the field, the same local workers became capable of identifying flaws, distinguishing different deposits, um, preparing features for photography and so on. And of course, here, what we're seeing is proof that the Kufti Risers were fulfilling their expected role of training up the local workers and that this community of practice they were developing was starting to reap benefits for its practitioners. Okay. While um, digs of the period were hiring a handful of, um, apologies, I went a little bit forward there. Okay, so while digs of the period were hiring handfuls of Egyptians in these supervisory roles, the Palestinian labour force was actually much larger and it could number anything anywhere from 50 to several hundred workers at a time. And these were working in teams were usually known in the literature as gangs, and people were given very specific roles in their teams. So you've got pick men who do the actual digging, unless they got put aside by their Kufti or Western supervisor who came in to do the tricky jobs. Um, the home men are putting the soil into baskets. It's been carried away um, to the spoil heap by the basket characters carriers and then people are sieving the spoil looking for missed finds and in this there's a hierarchy the pickmen are the most skilled and best paid the basket carriers the least despite having fixed roles in this system everybody's working together of course and they're able to learn through observation and what we find is that those who show aptitude or interest tend to get promoted within the team and eventually they start getting assigned to more challenging work on the site however this opportunity to develop um, their abilities and so on wasn't open to everybody. And this is where my slide with the, the women comes into it because women's roles on the digs actually were quite fixed and they're allowed to carry baskets, they're allowed to sieve things, wash pots, but that's kind of it. So here I've got a little bit of um, footage showing some of the women at Tel El Ajul washing pot up on the site. And this is a sort of typical routine that they got restricted to. The only exception really that I know of for this is the digs that were run by Dorothy Garrard um, up in Mount Carmel because she actually hired a lot more many women than other projects and she was giving them more responsibility than was usual for the time. But this is quite rare. Okay. Well, now I'm going to move on to a bit of documentary evidence. Um, and this very useful notebook here we have in the archives at the Institute of Archaeology, which gives us a bit of an insight into a makeup of some of these work teams. 
And this was written by the um, field supervisor, Carl Pape, when he was working for Petrit Teller Le Jewel. Um, fortunately, he's got good handwriting, which is one of the reasons why this particular notebook is so useful to us. And he, he records here on these two pages, 110 workers who are being organised into 17 different teams. Each team has its own team leader, and you see them in capital letters, and between four and seven workers with them. All the names we have on this list are Palestinian, there aren't any Egyptians here. And there's 49 different family names in the group, but with some repetition, suggesting that some members within this community are related to each other. And because we've got the first names of these individuals, we can actually work out something as a gender balance in the team. And we see the team leaders are always male, um, but most of the groups are including one to three women. Now, sometimes we can go a bit further, we can actually follow individuals through the field records to learn about more about their activities on the dig. And I want to follow this particular man here as an example of this, Hassan Salim. So here he is, one of these team leaders um, within the, the field workers. And if we look elsewhere in the notebook, I've got a rather delayed reaction on going forward. Let's see what happens. There we go. Um, we can find, let's see, it's forward too far. We can find um, him appearing another page of the notebook I've circled in here where it just says LH2, Hassan Salim. Well, LH2 is a field context. I'll show you the plan of it on the other side. Um, so this tells us he worked in that, that particular room on the site. Probably him and his team, I suspect, he's being used as a proxy for the whole group. In other records, we can trace him, for example, on this object envelope, which contained a toggle pin. And my arrow, unfortunately, my little um, circle has slipped, but just above where I circled, we can see Hassan Salim's name. And then on the other side, we've got an example of a tomb card from Teller Le Jewel in this instance, where he's circled on the back of the card and he's named as the excavator of that tomb. And there's actually a number of these cards with his name on them from both Telfer and Teller Le Jewel. So what can we tell from this evidence? Well, if you put together all the references I've found for him in our various records, we know he was employed by Petrie from at least 1928 through to 33. We know he dug tombs at a Jewel and Farah and that he was trusted enough to be allowed to work on his own as sole excavator of a number of tombs. And this is a sign that he was considered to be quite skilled. The fact also that he becomes the lead of a work team in the third Adjul field season also is a sign of confidence. And it's interesting because this sort of level of responsibility was initially limited by Petrie to his gufti men. So it looks as though we're seeing Hassan's personal ability allowing him to learn from his peers and advance through the system himself. This is actually reflective of a bit of a wider trend on Petrie's digs because over time we see him relying less on these gufty workers. So in his first 1926 dig, he brings out seven Egyptians from Egypt to do the digging, but within five years he's reduced this number to two and then he stops bringing out any Egyptians at all. And we can see here a rise in confidence in the abilities of his Bedouin workforce, who by now, of course, have got several years worth of field experience. Okay, well, most of the labour that Peter is using on these sites in southern Palestine were Bedouin from the Wadi Gaza region, and here we see a number of them at Tel Farah, and their tents where they're living were actually in the distance behind them. In the mid-1930s, Peter actually began a new excavation project in Sinai at a place called Sheikh Suwaid. And rather than looking to Egypt for his field stuff here, he starts to hire a number of these former Palestinian employees from southern Palestine to come down and train the local Sinai workers. So we see our untrained Bedouin of the Wadi Gaza region are now being redefined as experts in the community of practices created in Sinai. On the left here, I've got a letter written by Hilda Petrie to her daughter from the dig. And in it, she actually names a number of these men, which is really useful because we can match them to our records from the earlier work at Farah and Ajul. And of course, circled here, um, we can see our old friend, Hassan Salim. So now we can tie his career even further in history. Um, and we can see he's working in the 1930s in Sinai as well. Well, while this is all going on, um, other members of the Wadi Gaza archaeological community are actually being drawn north rather than south, and they're going up to work at the Quiche. And this was because Leslie Starkey, who had been field director at Gemma Farah and the first couple of seasons at a jewel, decided to start his own excavations there in 1933. And uh, like Petrie, he wanted a body of experienced workers around him. So what he does is he hires his former Bedouin diggers um, who move up to the Quiche with their families for the season. He steals Petrie's last two Egyptians, Sultan Bakit 
and Sadiq Abdeen and takes them with him. And he also pinches a number of Petrie's Western supervisors, such as Olga Tufnell, um, Gerald Harding and photographer Ralph Richmond Brown. And then for the rest of, of the local labour, he hires them from villages around the quiche. So here we have Starkey creating his own new community of practice from the foundations of an earlier one. Okay, let's um, now look at another little biography here. And one of the things we do tend to see is that outside Petrie's excavations in Palestine, Egyptian workers did tend to have privileged access to the high paid roles on digs. So the supervisory positions are specialist jobs. But occasionally we see Palestinians getting employed in comparable um, roles. And one such man is this guy, Oda Jirius, who I find very interesting. Um, he's a Christian Arab from a little village called Jifna in the West Bank of Palestine. You can see it here on the right. And he seems to have been hired first to work with a Danish team at Shiloh sometime in the 1920s. And this Shiloh dig was in close contact with the American archaeologist William Albright, um, to the extent that they're loaning each other equipment, giving each other advice and so on. And it seems they also appear to have passed on the services of Jirius as well. And so here we see a little bit of his career. Um, he moves from Shiloh to work as a foreman for Albright from 1930 onwards at various sites that Albright is digging, including Tel Bight and Sim. And he's working alongside Egyptian writers, Egyptian surveyors, um, Labib Soriel and William Gadd, and also a Palestinian called Bulof El Araj, who was actually from Ramallah, um, not far from where Jirius was born and was also acting as a surveyor at this time. Albright, though, uses him more extensively, and he sends him off to negotiate with local landowners to secure permission to dig. And then in 1934, he's going up the ranks and he gets promoted to head foreman. He then moves across to work at Teller Nazbar in 1935, um, where he becomes a field recorder. And this is quite an interesting job on the dig, where they have somebody who specially has a role of allocating context numbers in the field, filling out the labels for the pottery and the finds baskets, and also liaising with the surveyors about context and so on. He then um, moves on and works again for Albright at various places. And his last dig that I know him of is in 1936 at a site called Anata. And sometime between then and 1943, we hear that he dies. So. That's his career. Where does he fit into this community of practice? Well, in many ways, um, Jirius is standing at a nodal point between different groups within his network. He's got a role as dig negotiator, and there he's liaising between the director and landowners. As foreman, though, he's standing between the diggers and upper management. And in his role as field recorders, he's connecting the foreman and their gangs with all their knowledge of, of object context and so on to the surveyors and anybody else who needed to use that information. So he's basically an enabler of, of many logistical aspects of the dig and also a key player in collecting research data. Okay, so we've got communities of practice developing within these projects. They're allowing some participants, but not all, to develop particular expertise, and they're able to promote themselves in what is a rather specialised labour market of the period, selling their skills off to numerous foreign-run projects. With this, of course, networking is absolutely key, and their success in selling themselves is dependent very much on the personal recommendations of the co-workers, and particularly here, the head reyes. Um, their opinion is often sought by foreign directors when they're looking for um, new staff, but also trusted staff members like Labib Sorial and the project directors. And here I've just got a little example of that, looking at the Tel Bight Masim dig that Albright ran over four field seasons. If you look at where he's getting his workforce for, you can see he's actually using his his academic contacts or his, his peers to tie him up with his workforce. So Clarence Fisher is finding him surveyors, writers and conservator. He's taking over a number of staff from Elihu Grant's project at Beth Shemesh. And he's also um, getting his Palestinian overseer Oda Jirius from the Danes at Shiloh. Okay, so there's a lot of interaction of this type happening on digs of the period. Well, while I draw my conclusions for this talk, I'd like to run a short film for you made by Gerald Harding during one of the dual field seasons, just showing more members of our community of practice there at work. This series, basically, if we, we look at, back at what we've been doing, it's been all about showing how archives have the potential to change the types of narratives we tell about the history of our profession and how, despite their colonial origin, we can use the data they provide to counterbalance some of the biases of these contemporary accounts. 
So I hope I've been able to demonstrate how even some really mundane types of records can actually help us achieve this and bring more parity into how we represent the agents who are contributing to our understanding of the past. Now, my research into these worker networks in Palestine is still at a preliminary stage. Um, the next steps I'm going to take are basically going to dig deeper into the existing archives and try and identify more of these key individuals and more of these cross-project links. But I also want to try and learn more about the Palestinian digging communities because they're quite underrepresented in the, in the information that we have, just to see if the professional mobility that I've seen for the Wadi Gaza Bedouin is happening elsewhere in the country. And then putting all this together, I'd like to do some more formal network analysis to try and help visualise and interpret the complex um, interactions we're getting between these community practitioners. So um, I'd like to conclude by thanking our um, contributors to my research. And of course, that very much has to start with the many um, Egyptian and Palestinian men, women and children who excavated so many sites over this period and whose work has obviously provided the foundation for what we're doing now. I would also like to acknowledge the um, contribution made by the many organisations whose fabulous archives have been the core of my research. And I know it's a little bit irregular, but I'd also like to thank all my fellow speakers in this series, because I can't tell you how useful and inspirational your work has been, and it's certainly helping my research um, go forward from here. So thank you very much. Wonderful, Rachel, thank you. Um, and I'm wondering, oh, great. You, sorry, you stopped sharing your screen. Thank you very much. Um, and I know that we have um, some questions uh, that are coming in. So um, yes, let's turn to those. Um, so let's see, I'll just read them off of my screen. Um, are there any examples of local Palestinians who were trained by the Gufti's who then were able to move up the ranks in the dig hierarchy? Did attitudes of the Western dig staff towards the local Palestinian excavation laborers change or become more positive as these workers' skills improved with time, experience, and training under the Kuftis? Yeah, I think um, the answer to both is yes. I mean, I did show a few examples through that presentation of where people were able to sort of go up the hierarchy. Part of the difficulty is we can only track certain individuals because quite often our records are problematic in that we've only got abbreviated names. We can't always be sure that the names we see in the archives are the same individuals and so on. But um, it was possible to advance. We can see certainly people um, getting their skills valued more in terms of Promotion, for example, from carrying baskets to wielding a pick. I mean, that's a fairly low level promotion within the system, but we know of individuals where it happened um, because in letters in particular, there was occasionally people will make comments about that. He started with us as a young boy and now he's, you know, one of our most reliable workers and things like that. There is certainly a change of attitude, um, I find, in the letters as well. As I mentioned, Reisner certainly improved his view of the workers around Samaria after a couple of years of working with them. He was very disdainful at the beginning. He was, you know, much more appreciative to towards the end. Um, at the same time, we see that with Hilda Petrie talking about um, her, her Bedouin workers working in Sinai. She actually, she's got some disparaging comments. You know, they do tend to put in personal things about what they look like or whatever. Um, but then there's somebody, you know, she describes as, she'll say, one of our best men, you know, extremely reliable, all this sort of stuff. What I find really interesting is actually, I was going to show it, but I didn't have time. There was a series of camera scope images, stereoscopic images produced of the dig at Tel Farah for commercial sale to raise money for the dig. And one of the things they do in that is they show shots of the excavation in progress and a few sort of close-ups of some of the workers. And there's two shots of um, the Bedouin workers and they've got titles that reflect their expertise. So expert at a delicate task, a skilled excavator, it's not the sort of language that you usually find where they talk about our native workers and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when they, they've got a couple of similar shots of Westerners doing similar sorts of activities and they don't, they don't name them, they don't name any of them, to be honest, but they don't actually emphasise that they're experts. You know, it is, it's as if they're, they're bigging up their, um, their Bedouin contributors. And, I, you know, I did find that much more interesting um, as, a, as a kind of change in attitude. And I do feel actually that it was probably Petrie or one of the staff on the dig who wrote the captions for the camera scope images. They were filmed by a visitor to the dig. 
um, the guy called Richardson Barber Baker, but the language that's used in all the captions very much reflects the language that Petrie uses in his publications. And I'm pretty much pretty sure that that he's probably writing them or Starkey or someone like that. But yeah, there there is a lot of um, changing attitudes, but of course it will vary from person to person you know, and how open they are to actually recognising, you know, you don't get away from the colonial framework completely, you don't get away from the casual racism completely either. That's always an underlying thing. Fascinating, especially with, um, if um, I understood you correctly, those stereoscope images were really a sort of public facing, um, you know, kind of um, artifact, you know, from, from these projects. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's also yeah, interesting. Um, we do have a, a question from uh, Helen Dixon uh, from our uh, internet audience. Uh, first of all, she'd like to thank you for all of this uh, fascinating data and context. And then she asks, she says, uh, I'm especially interested in all of the film footage you found. Uh-huh. Why, why were these made and were they used uh, for public facing purposes uh, as far as you know? Yeah, well, there's two categories of film footage that was made um, on Petrie's digs. There was formal film footage that was filmed by the guy who did the camera scope images, actually, Richardson Barber Baker. He made some live footage of the project and they were shown as, as, um, you know, shown at sort of after lectures or as part of lectures to raise money for the dig and things like that. So it's part of the publicity machine. Unfortunately, that footage doesn't seem to have survived. Um, I've got hints about what was in it because people like Olga Tuffle will talk about it in their letters and so on, um, you know, when they're actually filming it on the dig, but um, I've never come across traces. And actually Barbara Baker's house got bombed in World War II, maybe it got lost then, but there were probably several copies because they showed it at America as well as England. So that's the first thing. Um, There was, however, informal personal film footage that got taken, and that's what I was showing you today. And this was taken by um, Gerald Lancaster Harding, who was one of the team members um, at Gemma, Farah, Ajul, and then Lakish. Um, he went on to become the de- director of the Department of Antiquities in Transjordan. And he just liked taking film, as a lot of people of the period did. And he made a lot of very informal films of all sorts of things, including the work on the dig. He's also got things like a visit to the Dead Sea, um, footage of a black and white sunset, which really doesn't work, I've got to tell you, um, and so on and so forth. But, you know, it's amazing to see these faces and people who, you know, previously had only been in still photographs actually doing their jobs. And that footage was discovered um, a few years ago when we acquired at the Institute of Archaeology the archive of Harding, which his um, friend and executor, Michael McDonald, gave to us very kindly. And we got all this film. It was all just in big canisters and stuff, and we didn't know what was on it, but we got it digitised. And it's been put online, a lot of it, on YouTube. And if you look at a um, website called Filming Antiquity, you can find all sorts of blog posts written about it. People have done some analysis and looked at things in all sorts of detail. But it's a really incredible source of information. And it brings these people to life, um, you know, in unexpected ways, which I really like. Quality isn't always great, but, you know, it's privately done. You don't expect it to be professional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And and so Mm -hmm. nice that it's been made. Uh, available on the internet so it's you know yeah that's that's yeah. Great. thank you well um, i've got to actually thank amara thornton for that she was behind the whole um digital project one of my colleagues at ucl wonderful and, and also another a good example too how you know some there may be important um elements of archives that are still in you know private holdings um absolutely and i'm sure yeah. there are in fact um one of my colleagues a guy called bart wagamacker's um, who, who's um, over overseas, he's done a fabulous website where he's basically been gathering data and old testimonies and all sorts of things from private individuals who worked on digs in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you look, it's called the Non-Professional Archaeological Photo... I'm going to get this wrong. Non-Professional Archaeological Photographers. I'm going to have a look and put it. Um, tell you what it is. But anyway, Ar- Archaeological Photograph Project, NPAPH, I think that might be it. Um, but he's got he's got all sorts of very informal stuff that it would have been lost and he's actually found the individuals who have it and preserved it um, and it's the sort of thing we need more projects like because as you you know this stuff gets lost so easily sure. you know somebody dies their relative throws it in the thing because they don't know what it is you know we've got to save this material because it's it's so useful for future study and to understand our own um, you know our own discipline absolutely absolutely uh, so a follow-up question. Uh, 
The attitudes of certain directors like Crowfoot are visible and traceable in correspondence. To what extent did these attitudes impact the relationships with these excavation communities of practice? Is there evidence in the archives of relationships between the Western staff members and local workers that comes through in photos, letters, or film? Were these workers treated fairly? Of course, it's always very difficult to judge how people are being treated in, in you know, still images, whatever. You get a sense of um, fondness, if you like, um, that the, the Westerners had of the people they were working with because you see them in the, the houses of their, their fellow co-workers. You see them interacting with them. They're engaging a lot of social activities off, off the actual dig out of work hours. Um, Lancaster Harding, for example, would often go and play his musical instrument with the local workers and things like that. Um, so you do get a sense that there was affection there um, and appreciation, one hopes, as well. And Harding in particular came, I think, to exercise that more than anybody in his later career because he worked very closely, um, you know, with everybody. He, he doesn't seem to have shown the same prejudice that some of the sort of um, more senior dig directors perhaps sometimes showed and so on. I think... With some of the directors, there is, you know, definitely signs of uncomfortable relationships. And we do have a lot of evidence, which I didn't go into here, of things like labour disputes and signs of a lack of communication, a lack of understanding, a lack of appreciation. They talk in letters about how they can cut the wages and, you know, because, you know, the econ economy is quite bad and things like that, which shows very little compassion or understanding, I think. Um, so there's so kind of the management side of things, which could be quite brutal. And then there's the personal things because people are working with, um, with the locals side by side and they're becoming friends with them. And, you know, that's what you get from the private archives, where the official archives, as I said, can actually sometimes be quite negative. It's interesting because Clarence Fisher, um, who has come up a few times in this series, was one of the key facilitators, I think, for getting pe people, moving people between digs in various roles. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, he had very bad labour relations with the Egyptian workers. There was actually a big scandal out there um, because he seems to have tried to take away some of the authority they've been given in things like um, managing pay and stuff like that. And there was a great deal of resentment. Mm -hmm. And yet when he comes to work in Palestine, you actually see when he gets sacked from Megiddo as director there, the local um, workforce actually seemed to go out and strike in sympathy. So you get the feeling that maybe they had a better relationship there. But, of course, you're reading lots of documents, putting the pieces together as the last seminar in this series kind of showed um, incidental information comes together and you read between the lines a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's variable. It depends on individuals. And some of the, the individual staff who came on digs were right. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to call them, but, you know, they weren't the sort of people who were inclined to get to know the people they were working with, you know, and they're the most colonial of all, of course. But quite often they're not the ones who stay. The ones who stay are the ones who learn Arabic. Um, who become friends with their communities. Mm -hmm. And, for example, Olga Tufnell, um, Sultan Bakita was guard at Lakeisha, apparently was writing to her in England. So, you know, these, these relationships do extend sometimes when the digs finish as well. Well, speaking of Olga Tufnell, um, we have a question from Jack Green, um, a researcher. Hi, Jack. Um, uh, so coming in from, uh, from the internet, and he, first of all, he says, thanks for the fascinating presentation, and then asks, were there transfers of knowledge and skills beyond the immediate excavations or field work as part of these communities of practice? I, I think for instance, like English language, uh, increasing knowledge of other sites and archeological ancient history of the region, uh, et cetera. I think there definitely were. Um, one of the interesting things I saw, um, I think it was to do with the Jericho project. I'm trying to remember my sources now, Garstang's project to Jericho, was that um, there's a lot of letters in the, the archives about him trying to arrange a local guard and so on. And he's actually using a guy who's running a local shop in that role for some of the time. And um, at one point, this guy wants to get a role as a sort of site tour guide. And so he's trying to get the department to authorise that. And clearly, you know, he's bringing in his local knowledge of the excavation, which he's been quite heavily involved with um, in various, you know, ways, but although he's not necessarily been digging himself. And he's, he's building that thing that he's learned into, you know, a new career for himself locally as well and making the dig part of the local community more. And this thing about visitors to site, tourism at the sites, I mean, I didn't go into any of that, but that's a whole new sort of 
output of knowledge production as well, because the people who are leading these tour guides are the locals. You know, it's not the Westerners. They don't stay behind when the dig's over. They go back home again. So that knowledge is going out into the community. Now, what they're not doing, of course, is any effective program of training the community, um, telling them what their outcomes are of the dig, giving them any feedback, letting them know what the publications have said about the dig. That sort of formal transfer of knowledge doesn't seem to be built into the system at all. So, of course, there are also parallel situations where locals are being excluded and in some sites they're not even allowed to visit the dig in progress, you know, which is the best, the worst kind of exclusion that you, you could have. It's their land and they're not allowed on it. Um, so, yeah, it swings and roundabouts. But, of course, I talk about a community practice on the dig. It doesn't end there because the people on the dig come from the local villages and communities and they engage with other people and create other communities of practice. So there are many potential ways in which knowledge could be passing out. And I haven't started to talk about the departmental representatives who are going, you know, to various sites doing their jobs, mm -hmm. um, their connections with local businesses, the local landowners. You know, there's all sorts of stakeholders who get involved. Yes, and I just, in a conversation recently uh, with Jeff Zorn, was uh, reminded and impressed by um, the distances that, so you'd mentioned uh, Antioch, which is of course in um, modern Syria, um, and then all the way down to Sudan, I saw in one of your, you know, so the, the Kuftis uh, moved around quite far distances. Um, and, um, you know, the if, if you think of it sort of from a network perspective, which of course you are, um, in each of these locations, you have sort of different hubs. Um, and, uh, but the, the, uh, the territory that's represented and covered uh, is really quite impressive beyond Palestine. Right. I mean, there's all sorts of things that come out of that as well, though, because if you think about it, they're being taken out of their communities and put somewhere completely different. And so you're going to get these little expat communities forming where they go. I mean, the Antioch archives are really fascinating. They've digitised and put them online. Absolutely amazing. But one of them, um, Fisher talks about his um, Egyptian and Palestinian house start getting, staff getting homesick, you know. And you've got to think about the, the impact of this. They're being taken away from their families for very long periods of time. You know, they're the breadwinners, so, you know, they're doing it for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they usually weren't able, I mean, the, the Bedouin at Wadi Gaza could take their families with them because they were more mobile, but quite often that's not happening. So, you know, these are going to be isolating environments as well to some extent. Um, and, you know, you've got to wonder too when you see people going to work on a couple of digs in Palestine and not appearing again, you know, is that because they're preferring to work in Egypt? You know, they've obviously got the choice about where they sell their labour. So it's such a such a fascinating set of windows onto this. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I, I believe that uh, Melissa Craddock, um, who is our uh, curator, might have some questions of her own. So I'll let her do that directly, please. Hi, Dr. Spark. Hi. Uh, I've been lurking in the background of the Zoom call. So just to yeah, quickly introduce myself to you and to the viewers. I'm a curator at the Bade Museum and I co-curated the Islands and the Archives exhibit um, so thank you so much for this incredibly rich and fascinating talk. And one of the most important contributions from my point of view, having uh, gone through the archives for the exhibit material is your focus on the individual career biographies of people who are at the bottom of these dig hierarchies. And one of those figures, well, several of them overlap with the Malisei archives, and one of those figures is Jirius, who we introduced. And as you mentioned, he worked with Bade at Nas Bay only in 1935, which was the final season. And so he appears as a somewhat vague and shadowy figure, figure in the archives that are available to us. So we don't know a whole lot about him and the information is pretty scarce. So uh, what you presented filled in a lot of the gaps. And I'm curious if, if you could go into a little bit more depth about which specific archival sources that you use to follow his career and what interested you in following him specifically? Okay, well, I mean, I sort of, one of the things I was doing is I was going through obviously all the records looking for individual names, building up a database of names and then looking for connections and seeing who were the most connected people that I could maybe follow. And one of the nice things about William Albright, um, who, who Julius worked for in a number of projects, is he is very good in his publications, particularly his preliminary reports, at actually giving credit to the people who do particular things, including his Arab staff. And so he mentions Julius on numerous occasions. 
And that's how I know what he was doing for Bardo. That's how I know he came from Shiloh. I haven't actually got hold of the Shiloh reports to try and see if they say anything about him. So one of the things I don't know is exactly when he starts working for them, for example. Um, but that was one of my sources. And then once I knew he existed, I started looking for him elsewhere. He doesn't really appear in the mandate archives I've seen, but I haven't exhaustively searched every single relative dig yet. So he may well pop up. But that's because he's not getting visas and, you know, permits to get railway vouchers and the things that the bureaucracy that usually shows up these individuals. Um, so it was from that um, mostly that I found the links and then just finding out where it was he lived and, and where the the geography of all the different digs were and seeing how far he was going out of his own area and stuff like that. Um, I found him not mentioned, where was he? He was, there was a photograph of him. Now, where was that? That was in the Tell and Nasper book, all the things, wasn't it? Um, one of the publications which actually named him. So we could see that was actually him. That's the only photo I've found of him so far. Um, but yeah, that was kind of it. And of course, you know, fabulous job on the on the um, online exhibit, by the way. I mean, Nasbury is one of the best digs for studying these issues anyway, because it's just got, you know, you've got the field manual of Bade and you've got the, the fabulous rich photographic record and everything. But it's just that just gave me the links to sort of take him a little bit further um, and see who he was, who he was working with. Of course, we know more about um, because we're a bit more visible. Um, where else did I find him? I'm just actually going to have a very quick look on my database and see if I've got any other sources in there. So let's see. Okay, so here we go. Um, oh, actually, I, I actually just Googled his, his family name and his um, village and actually found out he's got quite a couple of famous relatives and they're still kicking around, um, you know, heavily involved in, in Palestinian politics and things. Um, but yeah, it was mostly the Albright publications, the, um, yeah, literally, literally the actual site publications is where this has all come from, which is unusual because mostly I'm getting it from the informal records. But um, yeah, it's interesting though, because sometimes you look at the final publication and there may not be very much, and then you look at the preliminary reports and there's a whole lot more. Mm. So, you know, yeah, I think we got lucky with him. But I'm hoping because I haven't looked at, you know, the original field archives of all the American digs, I mean, quite probably he's going to be much more prominent there as well. Yeah, I would expect that. Um, so I have a somewhat related question that has mm. to do with these wider professional networks within, um, let's say, the, the greater community of practice uh, of archaeology in British and Native Palestine. And um, you mentioned that the, the Guptis and skilled laborers who were originally trained by major figures like Rice and Petri tended to have quite tight or close knit professional networks. Um, often it seemed like those roles were even potentially characterized as hereditary, or they could be passed down to younger family members who were trained along with, um, with their older relatives. And you also get some great examples of uh, some of those Egyptian workers who are moving from day to day to follow specific directors. And I'm wondering if you have found that trend within the local Palestinian communities of practice in terms of, um, so you also pointed out a couple of individuals who followed specific directors around for several decades. Did they also train their family members or involve their own uh, communities in this same kind of hereditary training way? Uh, and yeah, so is there any evidence of that? Um, I haven't found formal evidence, but I have found several relatives working together. At Lakish, for example, um, among the Bedouin that, that Starkey hires are three brothers, okay? So, you know, we know that they're, they're obviously related. We don't know the age differences between them. But, you know, if you think about also you've got a community, you're looking for employment opportunities, of course you're going to try and get your relatives hired. And there is a tendency, I think, because, you know, um, these jobs were quite highly sought after because it, with economic depressions and so on, you know, there wasn't always that much work available. There is a tendency to, to try and keep it in the family to a certain extent if you can. And with the Gufties, we see it because they, they sometimes bring their, their sons onto the digs in more junior positions and train them up. We do get this when um, with some of the Egyptians in Palestine. I think there was, there was an example of one of the um, foremen whose son went to work on dig on another site. Maybe it's Megiddo. Um, somebody was was had his son on the dig as well, but there's actually some references in, in some of the official um, directorial correspondence saying, you know, we, we'll have him back, but we don't want his son, he wasn't any good. 
So just having that connection didn't necessarily mean they were going to be successful. You know, you had to prove yourself as well. Um, but I think it would get your foot in the door, particularly if you're somebody who's being considered, you know, long-term um, employee, very reliable, you are going to probably listen to their recommendations, um, you know, and that, that kind of makes sense. But um, it also made sense that, that you'd, you'd also, you know, have many members of the same extended family being employed on these digs. One of the interesting dynamics you get is conflict between the different groups who are employed. Because we talk about community practice like it's one big happy family, but actually we find there's often a lot of tensions depending on where you're from. And this is down to who's getting those employment opportunities a lot of the time because you saw this actually with your NASBA um, online archive. You know, you have a lovely story there about this sort of the tensions between the hiring people from this village, this village does not getting enough work, complaints are made. Um, the same thing happens with John Garstang at Tel Kai San. He actually gets recommended by the department to hire less men from one village because it's causing discomfort in the area. And he actually said, I can't because when I signed the land agreement with the leaseholders, they told me I had to employ 60% of their villagers. So he actually was bound by his legal agreement to employ a certain number of men from that, that community. But, um, yeah, they're not all equal. In, at Kai San in particular, there's great stories. Veronica Seaton Williams tells us, who worked on the deep one season, about, um, you know, fights breaking out. And if Garstang was there, they were quickly settled. If um, his, I'm trying to remember who his, his field man was, um, if he was there, one of the other Westerners, he couldn't handle it at all and he'd go back to the dig house and then she'd have to settle it. So it's kind of like, you know, there was varying degrees of authority exercised by the individual members of the team with, with the people they're working with as well. But, yeah, there were problems. In Sinai, Petrie made his, his local Bedouin leave all their weapons by the side of the trench and that seemed to work quite well. So, But, you know, you can imagine there's a lot of resentment. I mean, I'm thinking about the men at Lakish who are coming from Wadi Gaza what are the locals thinking of? You know, what's the pay rates like? Are they being paid more than the local workers? They're certainly being valued more for their expertise. Um, surely that's going to be causing all sorts of issues as well. Yeah, and uh, something else that was brought to mind as we were speaking just then um, in the Nazi archives, not only do we have the correspondence from the, the Elbira Village Young Men's Club wanting to hire some people from the local village, um, but there's also sort of a bit of a the opposite issue, um, so you mentioned sometimes the landowners would, um, would write to the contracts that have to be a certain number of workers locally. And not say the one of the landowners and, and the owner of the dig house, Rachel Maloof, was having some kind of issue or tension with a lot of the local people, and she was pushing back against even letting them cross from the land or use yeah. the house at all by the later season. So, so yeah, an interesting um, contrast there and certainly shows a lot of the conflict that was happening within these local communities of practice. So thank yeah. you so much. And yeah, some some people manage these these issues well um, and others obviously aren't, aren't so good at, at communication, I think, is, is a key part of the whole thing and, and how, how much you go and talk to people about what's going on. Um, you know, the more... The, the Westerners held back and sort of waved their sticks and what have you, I think the worst relationships tended to get. So fascinating. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rachel Sparks, um, for a really uh, just fascinating talk. And and um, I was just trying to think through, I think yours is, is the first actually that's looked at some of these ideas between sites, right? We've had, because archives oftentimes will only represent, well, at least I, I can talk about the one at the Bade Museum, represents a single excavation. Um, but, you know, sort of thinking between excavations really opens up such a, a, a rich um, a rich set of data. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, thank you for the insights into these networks uh, and for um, further, you know, telling us about, you know, the, the daily lives of these people who are so underrepresented. Um, in our final reports and the, you know, the sort of the Western knowledge production that came from that era. So very much appreciated. Um, and just as a, a way of concluding, I'd also like to tell our audience that we have um, two upcoming talks uh, in May. I'm so very excited about that. We're going to move uh, away from the region of Palestine uh, 
Um, and uh, Kirsten Newman will be presenting on May 12th uh, on her research uh, into uh, a ancient Persia um, and of course, more, more modern views of it. Uh, and then Helen Dixon will be presenting uh, on May 19th uh, of um, views from uh, projects in Carthage, uh, so in Tunisia. Um, so we're very much looking forward uh, to those talks. Um, so um, stay tuned. Uh, and uh, right, we'll just uh, shift geographic focus a, a little bit, but similar themes will be tackled. Um, so uh, thanks again to Dr. Sparks for her um, addition to this uh, series. And we look forward to uh, seeing you all back for our two presentations uh, in May. So thank you.